Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Build Your Copywriting Business podcast. Hello, Kate. Hello, hello. Hello. And then also hello to our special guest, Shannon. Hey, Shannon. Good morning, or I guess afternoon, depending on where you're listening from. Very true. Could be the middle of the night somewhere. Yes. Well, um, welcome. We are excited to bring Shannon Broad to you today. Um, She is a copy coach. She is a CCA student, um, and she has a a really uh, interesting story. And I think she'll bring some inspiration and some insight to, to everyone who's listening. So Shannon, let's dig in. Um, tell us about yourselves. Tell us, uh, tell us your, how, what was your journey to copywriting? Oh, it was a long one. Um, I've been interested in writing my entire life, but I've always just kind of written just for me various short stories and poems and journal entries. Um, and it's something that I've always been told that I was good at, but again, with writing, typical mainstream is, you know, you can't make a living as a writer. So it was nothing that I pursued professionally. Um, And when I was in my early 20s, I was diagnosed with fibromyalgia. And about eight years ago now, I ended up having to leave the workforce altogether and, and go on disability because I just couldn't hold down a job anymore. And when my kids both started school, I found myself with a lot of free time on my hands. And I was like, there's got to be something that I can do, um, not only just to fill my time, but to fuel my soul and make a little extra money. And I came across the um, CCA ad on Facebook. And I thought, that can't be right you can't make six figures as a copywriter. Like, no, writers don't make money. (laughs) But I dug into it a bit and it just blew my mind that there was this whole industry that nobody ever talks about. And it's something that I can do from home on my own time and build my own schedule with as much flex time as I need and make that extra income and do something that I'm so passionate about doing. So I signed up and I just started building my business and went from there. And um, it's been just over a year now. And I've gone from being a stay-at-home mom on disability, relying on the food bank to now I just bought my own house. That's fantastic. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, it's been a a whirlwind of a year. (laughs) Yeah, I'll say. Are you officially, are you moved in? to? Is this the new... New digs, yeah. love it. Yeah, I'm officially moved in. Um, I don't have designated office space at the house, but we are going to build an outbuilding okay. um, that's going to serve as like a guest cabin slash my office. So it's going to be good. That's terrific. So yeah, and you're in more of a rural area too, right? Because I think sometimes people think mm, I can't do copywriting because I'm not located anywhere near any clients um so can you speak oh my gosh to you don't need to like you can literally be in the middle of nowhere and as long as you can get an internet connection you can be a copywriter um when I started my career I was living on a very small island in southern British Columbia in Canada um and there's no local advertising like it's all just word of mouth because everybody knew everybody and I had no problem building clientele. I've worked with people from England, US. Um, I I have a client that's in Norway um, and clients from Toronto, which is on the other side of the country almost, but everything's virtual now. So it's so easy. And our new house where we just moved in is actually up in Fort Nelson, BC, which is in the Northern Rockies. So I'm geographically just north of like Nome, Alaska. Wow. And we have, yeah, we have five acres in the middle of nowhere and I get internet so I can work. And I just like, you just hop on zoom or send your emails or like I said, as long as you have an internet connection, you can work as a copywriter and it doesn't matter where you live. Yeah. I loved when you showed us the photo of the Northern lights where you were moving to. And I was like, Oh, she's up there. She's <laughs> yeah. I'm so excited. I've never seen them in person before. Ooh. 
So that's going to be good. But we've had bears in our backyard and there's wolves around and there's all kinds of crazy wildlife just like hanging out in my backyard. It's amazing. That's incredible. Also really good reasons to stay inside. Don't go outside. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, the bears are going to sleep now. It's fine. I guess that's true. (laughs) Um, So when you were just first getting started, what were, what were some of the challenges or some of the road bumps as you were starting to learn, starting to work, all that kind of thing? Um, For me, the biggest challenge was just trying to find a balance where I, I was trying to figure out how many clients I could take on at a time and still be well enough to work because I have my disability. Um, So that was a bit of a challenge. I did have a little bit of burnout at first because I was studying like five hours a day and pitching and writing and trying to do all the things at once. And then I just took a step back and I realized like, this is my business. This is my career. And I don't answer to anybody in the traditional sense where I have a boss that I have to report to every day. So as long as I'm meeting my deadlines, it doesn't matter if I work at two in the afternoon or six o'clock at night or over the weekend or whenever works best for me. So that was, I think, my biggest challenge coming into this because I still had that very um, mainstream corporate mindset where you have to work eight hours a day, five days a week, and you have to get it all done and you have to do it all right now. And um, just having that aha moment where I was like, wait, no, I'm in charge. So I'll just do it when I can do it. And then just finding that balance between, okay, I can maybe only work on three or four projects at a time instead of five or six and building in that extra flex time just in case something happened and I needed to take a day or whatever the case may be. But once I got that figured out, it's been fantastic. That's great. Good for you. Well, and I think too, that even when people first get started, there's that temptation to, to want to go all in and to spend hours learning every day and hours practicing. And, and it's, it's, I mean, yes, if that's someone's journey and that works for them, great, but, um, but it's not necessary. And as you discovered, it's, it can be detrimental (laughs) to, to try to spend hours and hours and hours when you just don't have it in you. So good for you for, for identifying where those boundaries needed to be. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And so how long was it before you landed your first client? When did you start pitching? Do you remember? I, so I started the course in July of 2020 and I sent my first official pitch in August. Ooh, good but for as you. soon as, yeah, as soon as I had mentioned, oh, I'm, I'm getting into copywriting because I have friends that work in marketing. They're like, oh, I need a copywriter. Can you write this for me? And I was like, I just started learning. I don't know what I'm doing. And they're like, you can do it. So I like landed paid work within my first two weeks of even starting the course. That's amazing. And then I was just like, okay, everybody sat down. Let me get at least the foundations down so I know what I'm writing and I'll get back to you. <laughs> yeah. That's great. I think that some people, and I guess, you know, you knew that your friends were in marketing, but it didn't occur to you that they might need your help. I think a lot of people forget that it's such an important first step to just tell people. Tell the you, world. Exactly. Yeah. Tell the world that you are now a copywriter. Because even if your direct friends don't need help, they may, there may be friends of friends, you know, someone owns a, a coffee shop and they need help or with writing, obviously not with making coffee, but, um, <laughs> roasting beans, <laughs> roasting beans, roasting beans and writing coffee, um, uh, our spinoff podcast. Um, but, uh, it's, it's such an important first step. And I think a lot of people really undervalue it. Yes. Sometimes it can lead to direct work, but sometimes it can even just be a little bit of a little bit of validation and a little bit of uh, that first step in getting outside of your comfort zone, actually say it, owning the words, I am a copywriter. And it's a big deal. Absolutely. And I actually had a very similar conversation with one of our students yesterday on a coaching call. Um, I was reviewing her website and she had um, a piece in there about um, this is why I chose, this is why I'm becoming a copywriter. 
And I was like, no, you are a copywriter. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, on top and of the as fact soon that- as you own that, it just boosts your confidence and and you could just put it like, I'm a copywriter. <laughs> mm-hmm. Exactly. Exactly. As soon as you, as soon as you have, have learned and have started practicing, as soon as you are writing copy, you are a copywriter. And plus nobody wants to hire someone who's becoming a copywriter, right? I'm not going <laughs> to I'm not going to give money to someone who's becoming an electrician and invite them in to rewire my house. I want someone who's owning the fact that, that they are a, a skilled service provider. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And like, and that's the same analogy I used here. I don't want somebody who's becoming an accountant doing my taxes. <laughs> yes. Um, but also a very, a, a common, I don't want to say mistake, but a common kind of misstep for students is that fear to that fear of stepping up and saying, yes, this is what I do. Um, what other kinds of, of things have you come across on, on student coaching calls? Um, a lot of it is just confidence. Um, they just need that support, somebody to tell them that, yes, you're doing a good job and yes, you can do this. Um, and I come across that more often than not on the coaching calls is, can you look at this? Is it good enough? I'm like, well, it, it meets the parameters that it got my attention. So I don't see a problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. That's so true. Yeah. I'm amazed by the amount of people that start, whether it's in the CCA or elsewhere, start pursuing copywriting and say, is this really possible? Like I'm doing it and I'm starting, but I don't believe yet that it's, that I can, that me, you know, I see other people doing it and other people can do it, but for some reason, I think people have a hard time thinking about themselves that they can do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, this, and the same thing with freelancing. I think people think, well, okay. Yeah. All right. So I've, I've done a little research and copywriting is a real career, but is it really possible to make mm-hmm. a, an excellent income as a freelancer? I think there's that element of like, wow, that's a life I'd love to have. It can't possibly be possible for me. Um, and I mean, we see time and again, dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of people a month making it, making it happen for themselves. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And I think that's just a really common misconception that you have to be a special kind of someone to freelance. And I think what a lot of people struggle with is do I have the discipline to sit down and do my work when somebody else isn't paying my bills? Or when somebody else isn't telling me what needs to get done. And of course you do, but you have to be that somebody else to say, okay, I need to get this done today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great point. There's, there's no direct paycheck attached. I mean, there's no, you know, automatically not deducted. What's I'm looking for automatically deposited paycheck involved, but yeah, if you don't do the work, then that, then that payment from the client is not coming in. So it's, it's almost a little bit more um, impetus to do the work because if you don't do the work, you're not going to get paid and most human beings need money to live. And on top of the fact that, yeah, exactly. Like food. I like, I like having a roof over my head. Yes. You have a fabulous new roof over your head. Yeah. And deadlines too. I think people discount I mean, you know, in school, nobody, nobody liked a deadline. Oh, you have to, I was definitely a leave it till the last minute paper writer. Luckily it's not how I operate now, but you know, it was like, oh, deadlines and deadlines for client work are wonderful. Thank goodness for deadlines to keep us on track and make us set our rear ends down and get that work done. So I'm curious if you don't mind sharing some of the industries and types of clients that you're working with. I don't believe you've chosen to niche, um, but can you can you tell us tell us what you're doing? Absolutely. So I I have not chosen to niche. Um, I'm just the type of person where I just always need something new. I enjoy learning new things. I enjoy looking into different stuff that's kind of outside of my comfort zone. So I've written, um, I'm currently working with a supplement company that um, they have this fantastic cardiovascular supplement. Um, I have written for construction. I've written for tech. I've written for um, other marketing agencies. 
Um, I actually just signed on yesterday with an agency out of England um, and they do primarily tech and transportation, which is a weird combination, but I thought that could be interesting. <laughs> um, yeah, I've done some medical writing. Um, I'm also ghost writing a story for somebody right now. So yeah, I just dive into anything that sounds interesting. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and that, that keeps it interesting too, when you're not doing, I, you know, you know, that our, we talk about not needing to niche and it's actually being a really bad idea when people are first getting started, but beyond that, it's people's careers. If a couple, you know, after a certain point of time, they decide that they want to, but oh, why would you? There's so mm -hmm. many interesting things out there and interesting companies to, to write for, organizations to write for, and so much to like learn and discover as you go. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. And I always think about there, I know there, there was a handful of our students that um, all kind of signed on as freelancers with the same agency. And they're at first, they're like, this is fantastic. I've got regular money coming in and I can depend on that work. And within a month, they, every single one of them was like, if I have to write one more thing about plumbing, I'm going to scream. <laughs> I'm like, that's why I don't niche. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. That, that specialization can be, can be tricky. And I think mm -hmm. there's a misconception with it that, oh, if I choose, you know, especially tech finance, I'm going to get paid more because it's a lucrative niche when that's such a bad assumption to make. But there's, I don't know if you can speak to that, Shannon, in terms of your client base. And obviously you bought a house, you're doing all right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not starving. I haven't been to the food bank for like almost over a year now. <laughs> that's so amazing. Um, what a transformation. Uh, and it's such a relief to like not having to worry about where my kids' next meal is coming from because that's so stressful yeah. um, as a parent because my number one concern is making sure they're okay. So knowing that I could do this, often in my pajamas, <laughs> um, it just works for us. But um, yeah, I just having worked for so many different industries, your hourly rates, your hourly rate. And when you're pricing out your projects, if it's something that's totally new to you and there's going to be an additional however many hours in research, build that into the project. So where there's things that I know nothing about, I'm like, okay, that's going to take me an extra like four hours in research just to figure out what it is you do. I'm building that into my invoice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think that, I think that looking for ease is a mistake that a lot of, not just mm -hmm. copywriters, but mistake that a lot of people look for in their careers. Like, oh, well, you know, this will be easy or I'll just coast. And, and, and I don't know about you guys, but in the, the positions or work that I've had where it's been easy, I have been miserable because there's no, there's no mental challenge when you can do it with your eyes closed. Um, there's, there's no, there's no fulfillment. There's no thinking or there's no creativity involved. There's no strategy. It's, it's one of that's when you get back to going, Oh, how long until this is done? Or God, I can't wait till this work day is over or whatever. And that's, that's what we've all moved away from, right? We didn't get into copywriting to be bored. We got into copywriting to use those skills that we all have and develop them and, and use our brains. So, yeah, I think that, that, um, move toward ease or that, that desire or, or seeking ease, um, is, is a, big, big danger sign. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that's also one of the reasons why um, I enjoy coaching so much because then on top of the various different clients that I work with, I'm also seeing again, different things from the students that I work with. So it's constantly keeping not only the foundations of copywriting fresh in my mind, but it's it's showing me a whole world of copy and different ways of doing things and different ways of saying things so that my writing in itself doesn't start getting repetitive. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I think that that's one thing too, that um, students can sometimes forget about in, in our student only Facebook group is 
because it's so important, first of all, to be reading other people's copy and then also to be gently and supportively. That's, that is the, the fundamentals in that group, as you guys know, <laughs> um, but gently and supportively offering feedback saying, Hey, I really like this for this reason, but you know what? I think this could use a little bit of, you know, X, Y, Z, or maybe if you approach this direction, it, it develops you so much as a copywriter to think critically about, I mean, yes, about your own copy, and you certainly should be doing that, but about other people's copy as well and make suggestions about how it could be improved. And that just makes everybody a better writer. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what does your, what does your day look like now? or your average day. I know that you have, you've figured out more or less a good schedule that works for you. Um, but, or, and maybe that's a better question. Is there an average day? There's not an average day. Um, I never know how I'm going to feel day to day until I get out of bed. And some days I feel fantastic. And other days I sleep until almost supper time. Mm -hmm. Um, but I found what really works well for me is, um, a, only working when my children are at school <laughs> because it's incredibly distracting when they're home. <laughs> but also, um, I tend to just take my mornings for myself um, unless there's a special occasion such as this morning. <laughs> but um, yeah, I just, I really take my time with my morning coffee and just start thinking about my day and thinking about what projects I'm going to work on or if I have a deadline coming up. And even when I'm meeting with clients, if I know a, a certain project is going to take me seven hours to write, and I look at my schedule, I'm like, okay, my next two days are relatively open. I'll still tell them, like, if I meet, I meet with them on a Monday to discuss project details, and I know Tuesday, Wednesday are open, I won't tell them that I can have their coffee to them till Thursday or Friday. And I just always build in that flex time when I'm setting deadlines, because I don't know, I might make wake up on Tuesday and be in incredible pain and can't think, or, you know, my kid might be sick or whatever the case may be. So I always make sure that I build in that flex time for myself. And then I'm not missing deadlines and my clients are happy. And I have the time that I need for myself and my health. Mm -hmm. And they don't need to know why it's going to take me three days. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, I think it's yeah. an important tactic for everyone yes. is to build in because, because, you know, unless it is a genuine rush project and your client, you know, and you're charging extra for it, your client really needs it on, you know, in two days from now. Um, it's important for everybody to build in extra time with projects, not so we can procrastinate or whatever, but because life happens, whether you have kids, whether you don't have kids, whether, you, you know, it, crazy stuff comes up. And also there will be days when you just kind of get up and go, oh man, I got nothing today. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, it's not what we do is not magic, but there are some times and maybe you're just tired or maybe whatever, but you get up and you go, everything I write today is going to be awful. <laughs> so you spend that day doing your admin stuff or whatever. Um, but building in that, that extra time is necessary for everybody. And to your point, client doesn't need to know your schedule. It's the, you don't owe them anything in terms of like, well, I guess I really could have gotten this done on Tuesday, but I told them Thursday, if they're happy with Thursday, then great. Everybody's happy with Thursday. Yeah. I was going to say, and I bet, have you ever had a client push back on a deadline that you set that you suggest? No, I haven't ever had a client push back, but I did have one client. Um, it was, it's an interesting client and they had an email sequence that they wanted done and I got it done for them. And then I'm not sure what happened in the company, but they just had like this complete pivot and got back to me on like a Friday afternoon after I had delivered the original copy. And they're like, we're going in this completely new direction and we need an email sequence, but we kind of needed it yesterday. And I was like, okay, I've already told you guys that I'm moving next week and I'm not working next week, which means like it's four o'clock on Friday now. And um, I literally have two days of internet left before I hit the road and move almost a thousand miles away. 
So um, yeah, I, I could do it, but it's going to cost you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's going to cost you a lot. Well, mm -hmm. and that's yeah. the, that's, I think something that we forget or people forget if that, if you were on staff and your boss came to you at four o'clock on Friday and was like, yeah, I need this done. It's okay. I guess I'm going to do this. Whereas when you're a freelancer, you, you did them a favor by saying, yes, mm -hmm. I will do this. It's obviously you charge them an adequate amount, but you could just also very well have said, no, nope. I need more notice. I'm unavailable next week. Um, I can do it for you on X, Y, Z date, but I can't, and that's a, a freedom and quite frankly, a boundary that we all need to, to practice, but that's a freedom that someone who's on staff might not necessarily have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I feel like on staff, you have that added pressure to always be that yes person and just, okay, yes, boss, I will get that done, no problem. And a lot of times I feel like people go into that knowing that their boss doesn't really care that they just took up your entire weekend as long as it gets done. Mm -hmm. um, and there has been times when I've just flat out said, no, I'm sorry. Like I cannot get you a copy by the end of the day today. You just told me about it 10 minutes ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But how many times, and I say this because it happens all the time. It happened not long ago for me. I was moving and I was like, nope, I can, here's the weekend that I can get to it. And they were like, okay, we're going to take it. We're going to take it in house. And I checked back in with them that weekend that I said I could do it. And they were like, oh, yep, actually we didn't get to it in house. So if you could still do that, you know, a week and a half later or whatever it was. Yeah. And that's not uncommon. Yeah, no, exactly. There's I mean, no such thing as a copy emergency. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, and it's, you know, you respect your client's re requests and respect their due dates, but yeah. How many times has a client come to you and been like, I need this right away. And you're like, ah, you know what? I'm, I'm really sorry. I can't. And they go, okay. Blah, blah, blah. And then a week later they come back and, oh yeah. Okay. Well now it's priorities have changed a little bit and now we can do this. And it's sometimes that, that saying no establishes as in, you know, again, there is an element of being a partner to a client. There may be sometimes when you're like, ah, you know what? I wasn't going to do anything this weekend. It's supposed to rain all weekend. You know what? I'll just do it and I'll charge them more for it. There are times that you're going to do that for a client, but setting that, that boundary with a client is also really important to be the best it is also in a lot of ways, really important to be the best partner that you can be so that they understand they're not going to get stuff immediately as if they were sitting in the office, as if you were sitting in the office and you were at their back and call, just waiting for them to give you an assignment. Well, yeah. then it doesn't breed resentment too, which I feel like can happen if you're just saying yes all the time and you're getting mad at the client for it, when it's actually something that you need to look at yourself for and determine, mm -hmm. okay, when can I say yes? And it doesn't make sense. And when do I really for myself and my business need to just say no? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I find that it's not just with scheduling, but um, I've had difficult conversations with clients too. And they're like, I really want this written. I'm like, okay, well, you're paying for it. If that's what you want me to write, I will write it. But I think doing it a little bit differently or going in this direction might serve your business better. And just being willing to have those conversations with your clients, because I feel like as a copywriter, my job is to make them look as good as possible in whatever written materials they're putting out there. So if I, if they come to me with an idea that they're absolutely stuck on and it's not great, you kind of gently, again, let them know, like, hey, I don't know if that's the best wording you'd want to go with. Yeah. My recommendation is, yeah, absolutely. So Shannon, you are one of our coaches. So you are giving advice to people all the time. <laughs> but uh, if you want, if you were to give some advice to someone who is just kind of dipping their toes into copywriting, kind of thinking about it, but not sure if they want to move forward with it, what advice would you give them? I would let them know that A, it's absolutely possible. It's not one of those like far-fetched dreams that isn't achievable. Um, and if you're passionate about writing, just pay attention to the copy around you. Like how many advertisements do you see on TV or in the newspaper or on the subway or the bus or like it's everywhere. 
even when you're driving down the street, there's billboards and like advertisement, advertising is everywhere. Um, and all of that stuff has to be written by someone. So just like, a, like even how many emails show up in your inbox from various companies that you've subscribed to, it all has to come from somewhere. So if writing is something that you're passionate about, just take a look around and see how much of it is out there. And there's plenty of work for all of us. And as long as you're willing to put the work in and take the feedback, there's no reason why you can't. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's terrific. Um, and then also, if someone is listening to this and thinking, oh, this woman's smart, which she is, uh, I'd really like her to work on my copy projects. Um, where can people find you? They can find me at www.broadscopecopywriting.com. Um, yeah, my, my last name is Broad, and I'm not a niche writer, and I knew right up front I didn't want to be a niche writer, so I thought Broad Scope just worked. I love so that's it. the the name of my company and um yeah you can find my website and my portfolio there yes. check it out we'll link to it in the show notes absolutely last question for you i'm just curious what's what's next do you have do you have a plan for future plans or are you just riding out where you are enjoying the new house what's, what's oh, happening? um i am working on building up my client base right now and um I have this whole new area and a whole new chamber of commerce and all new local businesses to start pitching. So it's almost like I get to start over in my local area, but there's, like I said, there's always the internet. So you don't have to pitch local businesses, but um, yeah, I just want to build things up. My best friend is moving here on the 25th. And the long-term plan is because I really hate doing the admin stuff. Like I just want to write things. Who cares about the paperwork? So I, I want to build up to a point where I can bring her on as my admin assistant and she can do all the boring paperwork office stuff that she loves doing and I can just write the fun and creative things. That's fantastic. I love it. I love it. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, this has been fantastic. Thank you, Shannon. Um, super fun to chat with you as always, uh, but I know that this is also going to be really um, exciting and inspiring for, for all of our listeners. So thank you so much for joining us. No problem. It's always a pleasure speaking with you ladies too. Oh, thank you. And uh, there you have it, everybody. Another episode of the Build Your Copywriting Business Podcast is in the can and ready to go. And we'll catch you back here for the next episode. Bye everybody. Thanks for watching. Make sure you don't miss any tips, tools, or tactics for copywriters by clicking subscribe right now. And of course, you can always find us over at filthyrichwriter.com. We'll see you next time.